Well, I believe that God has spoken to my heart. This is probably about three weeks ago to bring this message to you today. And the message that I believe God wants to say to you is that <coughs> He desires a relationship with you that He wants you to understand better. Amen. Okay? He has a relationship, but He wants you to go further in the understanding of that relationship. And here's what I want to talk to you about, is understanding the nature of the relationship in a give and take sort of way. Okay? I've entitled the message today, Give and Take. Amen. Now, have you ever had someone come up to you and pretend that they know you? Well, it's happened to me, not so much people coming up to me, but telephone calls, uh, salespersons. And I have nothing against salespersons, that's their work. But I remember one time, the secretary passed along a person to me because uh, she said this, she said, oh, there's a friend on the phone. <laughs> so I say, hello, and uh, I'm listening to this person, and I said, I don't even know this person. And they're pretending they know me because they want to sell me something. And the first clue I got was when they could not pronounce my last name. <laughs> so, what would it take to have a relationship? I had no relationship with that person on the phone because a relationship takes this. It takes give. If you've never given to someone a conversation, a call, if you've never received from someone any kind of email or communication at all, then you really have no relationship with that person, right? Because every relationship that's a true relationship is that process of giving and taking. Now, I'm going to turn your attention today to the book of Malachi. Malachi is a small book, just four chapters, that's at the very end of the Old Testament, just before, a few hundred years before the coming of Jesus. We have this prophet Malachi that is preaching and challenging the people of God. Okay, rewind with me a little bit right now. The nation of Israel was a people that God called to separate themselves from the world to belong to Him. And the nation of Israel, as they uh, proceeded through the centuries, they came to a place where they hardened their heart against God. And God allowed them to experience reversals and setbacks. He kept on speaking them to them by the prophets. But they came to the place where there was no repentance. And so they went into what we call exile. Some enemy countries swooped down upon Israel and Judah and took the people out of their own land. They destroyed the temple and the people were heartbroken. After 70 years, God allowed those same people, the Jews, to go back into the land of Israel. Now, while they were there, they had their ups and downs. But one of the greatest problems the Israelites faced when they came back was that they tended to substitute form for heart. And so the people were back in their own land, but they were just going through the motions. Let's call it apathy. The people had religion, they knew about the sacrifices, they had priests, but they were apathetic. Okay, they didn't really care. And it was, it was, it was a big issue. So Malachi comes along, he prophesies, he preaches to the people, and he does so with all kinds of questions. Malachi is a book of questions. God is getting his people to question why they are in the place they are. So I want you to read with me from the book of Malachi because God is specifically focusing on the priests. 
Okay, let's take a look. Let's turn this off. And now, you priests, this warning is for you. If you do not listen, and if you do not set your heart to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse on you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them, because you have not set your heart to honor me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. And you will know that I have sent you this warning so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and turned many from sin. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty, and people seek instruction from his mouth. But you have turned from the way, and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people, because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in matters of the law. Can you say amen at the reading of God's word? Amen. Turn that light back on. And so a message was brought by Malachi, not only to the people, but to the priests. Now you realize, don't you, that now that Jesus has come, we are declared in the Bible to all be priests. You know that, don't you? that instead of us having to go through another individual to God, we have access to God through Jesus Christ, our high priest. And so Peter says this verse, or he preaches this to us, speaking of every believer in Jesus. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people belonging to God. So what God says about the priest then can also be applied to us today. That we can listen to what God is saying and gain from it because we are in a very privileged relationship and status with God Amen. as having royalty in our blood through Amen. the blood of Jesus Amen. and having the wonderful responsibility of being a priest in relationship to our God. Now, the priests from the Bible days came from two sources. Aaron, who was the first priest with Moses. You remember that? Aaron was Moses' brother. and He became the first high priest of the nation of Israel. And then you had a whole tribe of Israel. The Israelites were broken up into tribes. And you had one group of people, which was called the Levites, who were all dedicated to be priests, helping Aaron, but mainly serving God. So you had this whole large group of people that were set apart to God, and they were expected to have God as their portion. They were not even given uh, land in the... Uh, nation of Israel as far as you know, personal possession, uh, God was their possession. Now, what does God's word teach us about this relationship that Levi and God were to have, this whole tribe of Levi? Well, it can be boiled down to one word. Okay? It's the word covenant. God wants, this is his desire now for you and for me. He wants to have a covenant relationship with you. Amen. Now, what is a covenant? A covenant 
is a relationship with another that's entered into by promise. Promises are made. And God has said to you, He said, I am willing to make promises to you. In fact, God did the greatest thing of all. He said, I am willing to seal these promises with the blood of my Son. So Jesus Christ came into the earth and lived a perfect life and shed His blood and now we are able to enter by faith through His grace, enter into a covenant relationship with God. But understand something. That a covenant relationship is a give and take relationship. It's not just what God has done. There's something that you are responsible for in the covenant. Amen. Okay, are you with me so far? Amen. So what does God's Word teach us about this give and take relationship with God? This is huge. This is so important. Here's what we're taught from the Bible. Understand that you get back what you give. Now, I'm thankful that God forgives me and us of what we do. God is a gracious God. He wants to forgive. But if we are people who claim to be in relationship with God, and yet continually just give God trash in this relationship, then we're going to receive back what we give. Now, I have to say that based upon the Word of God. Look at what God says. If, He's talking to His people now, God is saying, if you do not listen, and if you do not set your heart to honor my name, says the Lord, I will send a curse on you, and I will curse your blessings. Now, those are strong words. Amen. Because God loves us more than anyone else. But he wants us to take him seriously. God is not just some heavenly grandfather that when we do something evil, he just kind of looks at us and just laughs a little bit. Says, oh, those are just my kids. No. He, he loves us when he hates evil. So he doesn't want us Amen. to just give him trash all the time. Amen. Thank you. I don't know who takes the trash out in your house, but... This is me. I'm the trash man. And sometimes I'll walk by the trash and I'll see that it's full and instead of taking it out, I just push it down deeper. <laughs> and then a few days go by and my wife will say something like, Honey, you realize that the trash really smells? I said, You know something? I didn't even know that. <laughs> so, how many of you know trash never gets better? Amen. Stay in the same right where it is. It's got to be dealt with. Thank you, Lord. And so, if I'm faithful to just take the trash out, then there's a new thing that happens in our house. Clean. My wife has a smile. And there's a, there's a, a fragrance. <laughs> you see, the people of Malachi's day, which was also the days of Nehemiah, the people were not taking God seriously. They were giving Him a deaf ear. They were giving Him a hard heart. They were giving Him a trashy mouth. And God was telling them about it. You know, God can trash our life. Sometimes we do that very well ourselves. Amen. But I don't ever want to get to the place where God has to say about me, I will send a curse on you and I will curse your blessings. Amen. Man, those are serious words. I don't ever want to be in that place. Because we might think that we have it all together and everything's going fine. Yet we know that we're you know, offending God over and over again. And there will come a time when God says, you know, I'm just going to lift my blessing. He did it to Israel. 
He'll do it to us. I'm just going to lift my blessing. And when God lifts His blessing, be careful. I mean, it's not a good thing. Because we have a hedge about us as believers in Jesus. There's an invisible spiritual wall. Yes, we have troubles and we have challenges and so on. But the blessing of God is with us. And God says to, the, to those people, He said, I'm going to curse your blessings. I don't want my blessings to be cursed. I'm thankful for God. I'm thankful for the blessings. So I have to be willing. I have to be willing to recognize that I get back what I give. I don't want to give God trash. I want to give God my best. Amen. One of the faults of the people of Israel is they brought sacrifices to God through animals. Okay, that was taught in the Old Testament. But many of them, and even the priests were accepting this, they were bringing animals that they were already going to throw away. Animals that were blind, animals that were lame, animals that had diseases. They were saying, these are good enough. So in other words, their heart wasn't in it. They were sacrificing to God and going through the motions, but it was just cheap stuff. It wasn't anything that was of value. It'd be like us, you know, if we had an apple that we ate, and after we eat it, we sit it down for a while, and it becomes, you know, brownish, you know what I mean? And then we take the apple and we say, God, here's my gift to you. This brown, rotted apple, because I took everything else. God wants our best. Amen. He doesn't want a lame sacrifice. Amen. He doesn't want us to, you know, like I was talking to somebody a little while back, well, I pray once in a while when I'm not too busy. In other words, God, I'll give you my lame sacrifice. I do everything I want to do, and then if you have any leftovers, boy, you've got to be really happy with me because I talk to you once in a while. Please. Amen. Right? Amen. Because don't give God something lame. He's God. He knows our heart. Amen. Well, the Bible goes on to say, those who honor God, God will honor, but those who despise God are going to be lightly esteemed. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people because you have not followed my ways. So God can take our reputation, He can take our good name, and it just could be, it could be gone. Now you might say, well, Pastor, that's pretty negative. That's pretty, you know, like depressing. No. God's word is never depressing. Amen. It's always challenging. Amen. But you see, God's will for us is not that he would give us something evil. It's not that he would curse our blessings. He really wants to give us something great. Amen. So covenant, living in covenant relationship with him means not only you get back what you give, but that God wants to give to you. Amen. Okay? He initiates the covenant. In other words, He's the one who came to you and asked you, do you want to be married to me? That's what God asked. Amen. Now, don't think physical, okay? Because the Bible says we are one with God in spirit. We are His bride. Okay, So we as God's people are married to Him in spirit. So He initiates the covenant. He comes to us and says, will you? And so we want to respond to God. Because God has something wonderful for us. Amen. I've been thinking about this for a long time. Here's Amen. what God has for us. The same as the covenant with Levi. This is so good. You have to read this. Okay, you ready? Read it together. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. So what does God want to give you? Life and peace. Life and peace. Amen. Anybody think that those are valuable? Amen. Life and peace. Sometimes when I share Jesus with people, I just 
Put it right there. I say, you know, God wants your life. Amen. And sometimes people take it the wrong way. It's like, wow, God wants to take my life? I better run from God. <laughs> well, yes, God wants to take your life, your life, but He wants you to experience His life. Amen. Big difference. What does God want to give you? He wants to give you life. I love the word life. Life is something that takes place on the inside. It takes place because the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life lives in us. John tells us, in him was life. And that life was the light of men. 1 John chapter 5 tells us that he who has the Son of God has life, but he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Amen. The Bible has two words for life. One of them is bio, which refers to our physical existence. The word biology comes from it. And the other word is zoe, which is the word life, which means it's a spirit experience. We were all dead at one time in trespasses and sins. But the Bible says God made us alive through Jesus Christ. So He offers us life. I want that, don't you? I want it. I don't want to just go through life dead. A lot of people are unsatisfied. They're totally unhappy with their life. Their life stinks even if they have all kinds of stuff, because they're not experiencing the life of Jesus inside of them. Amen. What does God give? What does He want us for, for in the covenant? He wants to give us life, and He wants to give you what? Peace. Peace. I believe in a real devil. I believe that. Because there is a personality called Satan who opposes and hates God and does everything he can to make other people hate God. And Satan will get you because he wants to give to you. Satan also wants to give. And Satan is able to give certain things. He's able to give people pleasure. He's able to give people thrills. He's able to give people the feelings for a moment. But one thing Satan can never give. Peace. Amen. Because everything the devil gives comes with chaos. Amen. And always is sour in the end. Amen. But only God can give peace. Thank you, Lord. You see, the scriptures tell us that with the wicked, there is no peace. Oh yeah, you can live for yourself. Be as wicked as you want. Go for it. You don't die and go to hell. You know, it's your life. But you'll never have peace. But oh, when, once you surrender that heart to Jesus, thank you, Lord. man, I'll tell you what. The, what you've been looking for, He gives you rest on the inside. Amen. That rest is so awesome. I was just reading yesterday about the woman at the well. And she's just restless for life. And she's looking for that living water. And she says to Jesus, give me that water so that I may drink. And Jesus says, go call your husband. Oh, she says, I don't have a husband. Jesus looks right through. He says, well, you know, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five. And the guy you're living with now is that your husband. I'm stunned. Amen. But Jesus says to her, Amen. Says, You'll drink this water and you'll thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give, this living water, will never thirst. Why? Because this is the water that's eternal, that's inside, that always keeps going and keeps going. He never he doesn't fail 
to meet our desires. Amen. He doesn't fail. He wants to give to you. Now, I hope that right now in, the, in this message that you're saying to yourself, well, thank God you know, for the covenant that I can be with Almighty God. I can be in this covenant through Jesus where He gives me life and peace. But so many people stop there with the covenant. They think the covenant is just about what God wants to give to them. They go through life and say, God, bless me, bless me, bless me. And when the blessings don't happen or things are really difficult, God, I'm angry at you. God, I don't like you because you're not so nice to me. <coughs> well, here's the point. A covenant is a give and take. Okay? A covenant goes two ways. God is saying to you, He's saying to me, I will give you life and peace. But God also expects something from you. Because that's a relationship. There's no relationship if God is just some uh, grandfather that sends you gifts every once in a while that you never even met and don't even know. That's not the kind of relationship God wants to have with you. He wants to give to you, but oh yes, He expects from you Amen. if there's going to be a relationship. So what does He want from you? What does He want from me? Here it is. My covenant was with Him, again Levi, a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to Him. Amen. Now, the Bible doesn't stop there. This called for what? Reverence. And he revered me and stood in awe of my name. So what is God looking for? He's looking for reverence. What is reverence? Reverence is honoring God as holy. Amen. I was in a church for 15 years, and I remember about halfway through pastoring this church, I was just so desperate for the presence of God in our services, and I just got on my face before God and said, God, how can we have more of your presence in our midst? And just like a clear, you know, a, a clear thought that came from God, this clarity opened up my mind. God dropped this simple truth. If you want to have more of my presence, honor me more as holy. Amen. I thought, wow, that is true. Because we can't be watching R-rated movies on a Saturday night and experience the presence of God on Sunday morning. Hello? It doesn't work that way. Amen. And we can't be at home hollering at our wife and then expect that God's just going to oh, flood us with all kinds of life and peace in, it, in our relationship. And we can't be reading trashy novels and then expect that we're going to be sensitive to hear His voice. Romans chapter 8 verse 6 says, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Amen. So I will share to you, church, that holiness does matter. Amen. God, he, he doesn't expect that we are going to be sinlessly perfect in all of our thoughts and attitudes, but He does expect us to honor Him as holy. And so when we start to do something that's evil, or we start to watch something that's evil, or we start to read something that is not of God, then we learn to turn away from it because the fruit of that is is not good. Amen. It doesn't lend itself to having peace with God. So especially today in this sex-saturated society and in our world that completely is you know running from God, we have to make important decisions every day that are going to say, God, I'm going to reverence you. Because Amen. that's the relationship aspect. That's the part that we have. 
God doesn't ask us for just amazing feats of, of, of power. But we have to, you know, just we have to climb the highest mountain in the world with a t-shirt. He, he says to us, I want you to reverence me. I want you to honor me. That's our privilege. To stand in awe. One thing we have to be careful about, especially as a pastor. You know, he was talking to priests here. Pastors especially, people who are in church leadership, because we're around the things of God, like every day, it's easy to take God superficially. It's easy to just kind of like, you know, play the, play the game, go through the motions. You know, think of God as somebody just as your buddy that you joke with. I have seen too many pastors fall off. Amen. Thank to know that, man, we've got to treat God holy. Thank you, Lord. And the Bible says, watch your own life. Thank you. Guard your own spirit. See, we can't take this thing lightly. This is life and death stuff. Yes. This is eternal life stuff. And so, God, give me the grace, give us the grace to treat you holy, to honor you, to reverence you. And when we do stuff that's wrong, may we just be so quick to admit it, and so quick to repent and turn from it. Can I hear an amen on that? Amen. So yes, God does expect something from you. If you're part of His family, then He expects for you to become like Jesus. You ever notice that sometimes people in the same family, not only do they like start, they talk similar, but you ever notice that they walk similar too? We were making fun of the woolens yesterday. Someone was, had the, the, the woolen walk, you know? It was just like, Mike, Rhea, kids, it's like, you know who they are, even if you saw all of their shadows in the dark. That's the woman's. And so, if we're in the family of Jesus, we start to talk like Him, right? And we start to walk like Him. And people will see, like, oh yeah, you know what? God must be in that person. Amen. You see? Because there's nothing in me that's special. My flesh is just as ugly and you know, corrupt as your flesh. Amen. You know, it doesn't matter how much we polish the flesh to make it look good. It's still flesh. But what people really need is Jesus. Amen. Yes. Amen. Right? And so, what is God looking for? He's looking for us to change. Amen. Thank you. There's a book title that's called Change is Good. You go ahead and start. <laughs> You know, we all think change is good, but let other people do the changing. No, God wants us to change. Amen. And so, if we have this nasty little habit that doesn't belong in our life, then by the grace of God, let's, let's change that. We can change God's power. Maybe we have a little gambling addiction here, or a little porn addiction there, this addiction. God wants to change our life. There was a, a lady who, and I remember, I think I might have shared this before, but she shared a testimony that impacted my life, and I've thought about it a lot. And here's how it goes. This lady had a sickness. She wasn't that old, but and she was a believer in Jesus. But she died. And she tells a story that after she died, she found herself in the presence of Jesus. But she couldn't quite see him very well. And Jesus started to make his way toward her. And he was saying just two words. And she couldn't quite catch it until he got closer. And what he was saying was this. Only leaves. Only 
leaves. And it made her feel badly, but she didn't quite get it until she woke up. She found herself on the bed, healed, not dead. And then it came to her that Jesus was telling her that in her life, even though she knew so much about God, that she was producing not good fruit, but just leaves. You see, Jesus is looking for fruit from our life. He's looking for us to grow the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's His Spirit inside of us that grows that. We have to yield to Him. We have to desire Him. We have to seek Him. But He wants to grow that wonderful fruit because He wants you to be a blessing to the other people around you. And that can only happen as you take the covenant of God seriously. Let me put it another way. A.W. Tozier said it this way. He said, yeah. here it is. God expects the best from us because He always gives His best to us. Amen. Will we give Him our best? Amen. Can we do that? Amen. We're in a covenant relationship, right? He loves us so much. He's given us life and peace. He's given us His presence. So Lord, we want to give you reverence.